Hello and welcome to the video. Today I'm going to be talking about understanding renal function in terms of the underlying pathophysiology and the clinical application, specifically an approach to acute kidney injury. So without further ado, let's get right into it. At the most fundamental level, the kidneys filter the blood to produce urine. And in doing so, it is able to perform a number of important physiological functions, such as the urinary excretion of waste products, and the regulation of acid-base status, electrolyte levels, and fluid balance. Therefore, in order to assess renal function, we must ultimately be able to measure the kidney's ability to filter blood and produce urine. We can formally call this the glomerular filtration rate, which is, conceptually, the rate at which blood can be filtered through the glomeruli and passed through the nephrons to ultimately produce urine. Now to determine the true glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, you need to measure the filtration rate of a molecule that is 100% filtered and undergoes 0% tubular absorption or secretion, as only then, by measuring the serum and urine levels of this molecule, you'll be able to determine the rate at which it is being filtered by the kidneys, which is the GFR. Now practically, this is very difficult because a number of molecules are not filtered, and of those that are filtered, a number of them are reabsorbed or secreted to various degrees, which would mean using such markers as a marker of renal function or GFR would be inaccurate. However, molecules do exist which essentially go through 100% filtration with no reabsorption or secretion, and an example of this is inulin, which can be used in experimental studies to calculate the true GFR. By injecting this polysaccharide, determining the serum concentration, and then determining the urine concentration after a period of time. However, as you can imagine, this can become quite impractical, especially in a busy healthcare setting, where we need to know the renal function of a patient relatively quickly and easily. So instead, we use something called the eGFR, or the estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is essentially to use a formula or an equation to estimate the patient's true GFR. Now, as with every formula, we need to have our input variables, of which the most important one is creatinine, which is the marker of choice for the various eGFR equations. Creatinine is not as perfect a marker as inulin, as creatinine undergoes a bit of tubular secretion. But its biggest advantage over inulin is that creatinine is naturally produced as a breakdown product of creatine, which is a breakdown product of muscle. And since creatinine is essentially all filtered and doesn't undergo any significant reabsorption, it can be considered as a reasonably good marker of renal function and is the one that is most commonly used. But because creatinine is essentially a byproduct of muscle, the baseline serum levels of creatinine are highly dependent on the patient's muscle mass. And of course, muscle mass varies greatly between patients, depending on their age, sex, weight, and ethnicity. The reference range for creatinine is roughly around 60 to 110 micromoles per liter, which is quite a wide reference range, with the upper limit of normal being almost double the lower limit. And so, if the patient had a baseline creatinine at the lower limit of normal, and their renal function deteriorates and their creatinine actually doubles, their creatinine may still be within the normal range, despite having a significant kidney injury. So what this means is that even though we use creatinine in our eGFR calculation, because it has suitable properties to be a biomarker for renal function, using creatinine alone is not a great marker of renal function, because of the variability based on the patient's muscle mass. But by taking into account the serum creatinine level, along with other variables that affect muscle mass, such as age, sex, weight, or ethnicity, we can get good estimations of the glomerular filtration rate by using these variables in various formulas. One of these formulas is known as the cockcroft galt equation, which is used to estimate the creatinine clearance, which is essentially a marker for GFR. It uses the variables of serum creatinine, age, sex, and weight. This equation is commonly used to guide dose adjustments in renal impairment, 
and is particularly useful because it uses the weight variable, which arguably makes this more accurate, as muscle mass generally tends to increase with increasing weight. This is commonly used in the inpatient setting, where the weight of the patient is often known. However, the cockroft gold equation is not used to report renal function in routine blood tests and in the outpatient setting because it would be impractical to weigh all patients to use this equation every time the patient has a blood test. So instead, we have other equations which are used to report the renal function in routine blood tests. These are the MDRD which was developed from the Modification of Diet in Renal Disease study, and the newer CKD-EPI equation, which was developed by the Chronic Kidney Disease Epidemiology Collaboration Research Group, which is the formula used by most institutions today. Both the MDRD and CKD-EPI use the variables of serum creatinine, age, sex, and ethnicity, which as you can see is pretty similar to the cockroft gold except weight is not required, making this practical for use in reporting renal function from routine blood tests. These equations are very good at estimating the GFR at low levels and are actually inaccurate at high normal or supranormal levels, which is why the eGFR is often reported as greater than 90 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, rather than specifying a value, which is fine because the main utility of the eGFR equations are to monitor renal function in chronic kidney disease, which is really only significant when the eGFR is less than 60. Another important point to note is that the eGFR calculations are only accurate when the patient has a serum creatinine in a steady state, that is, that there are no acute changes in the renal function. To understand this, we can use a hypothetical example Say we have a patient with normal renal function that is shown on this graph here, where in red we have the normal low serum creatinine, which is at steady state and is steady over time. And in blue, we have the eGFR, which is also steady. So now hypothetically, if the patient suffered a significant renal insult, such as the clamping of both of their renal arteries, then technically their eGFR will immediately go down to pretty much zero. But if you then take their blood tests five minutes later, their creatinine is going to be more or less the same as when it was before you clamped the renal arteries. Of course, the creatinine will then rise over time, but it does take some time to rise, as shown by this graph here, where with the clamping of the renal arteries, the eGFR suddenly drops. But the creatinine takes time to rise from the baseline. This is because unlike other markers where the injury itself is responsible for the release of the biomarker, such as the way an infection leads to a marked elevation in CRP, the creatinine will rise because there is a reduced clearance of creatinine and the production and excretion of creatinine are usually in balance, leading to a steady state baseline creatinine. But when there's a significant renal insult that leads to an acute reduction in the glomerular filtration rate, the creatinine will continue to be produced but will take time to accumulate and thus rise over time. What this means is that in an acute kidney injury, the rise in creatinine is always going to be slightly delayed from the onset of the renal insult. And so the rise and fall in creatinine at any point in time may not actually represent the true state of the kidney function in the setting of sustaining and recovering from the acute kidney injury. Therefore, the eGFR calculations in the setting of acute kidney injury are not going to be accurate because the creatinine is not in a steady state. It is undergoing a lot of dynamic change. And so we shouldn't be using the eGFR that is reported to report the patient's renal function in the setting of acute kidney injury. The eGFR should really only be used in the setting of chronic kidney disease. In acute kidney injury, we should really be just reporting the level of the serum creatinine and how this is changing over time, how far it is above baseline and whether it's going back toward baseline or not. Because it is the changes in the serum creatinine on a day-to-day -day basis that gives you the best indicator, albeit slightly delayed, of 
renal worsening or renal recovery in the setting of an acute kidney injury. So now that we've discussed some concepts regarding kidney function and acute kidney injury, we can go on to discuss the definition of acute kidney injury and the underlying etiologies. Acute kidney injury, or AKI, is currently defined by the KDIGO criteria, which stands for Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcome, a leading global organization for kidney disease. Prior to the present KDIGO criteria that was first published in 2012, other criteria like the AKIN and RIFLE criteria were used. KDIGO has announced that a new 2023 updated criteria will be available later this year. But at present, we define an acute kidney injury as a serum creatinine rise of more than 0.3 mg per deciliter, which is converted to 26.5 micromoles per liter within a 48 hour period. Or a serum creatinine rise of more than one and a half times the baseline within a week, or a urine volume of less than 0.5 ml per kilo per hour for six hours, which is generally considered the lower limit for a normal urine output. In practice, the AKI diagnosis is usually made by the rise in serum creatinine from serial blood tests, as it is generally impractical to measure urine output unless the patient is in a highly monitored environment. AKI severity can be classified into one of three stages depending on the degree of increase of the serum creatinine from baseline, where stage 1, 2, and 3 AKI is defined by a serum increase from baseline of one and a half times, two times, or three times. If the AKI is so severe that the patient requires dialysis, then this also classifies as a stage 3 AKI. Staging of AKI is useful to reflect its severity but doesn't usually affect the direct management of the AKI, which is dependent on the underlying etiology. While a greater rise in serum creatinine generally represents a greater severity of AKI, it's important to note that there is no absolute serum creatinine level that is used to define when patients will need to initiate dialysis. The indication for starting dialysis in a patient with renal impairment is at the point when the patient displays manifestations of the kidney losing its ability to perform its other important physiological functions, which is generally but not necessarily correlated with the severity of the serum creatinine rise. More specifically, the indications include severe metabolic acidosis associated with the AKI or renal impairment, severe electrolyte disturbances, particularly refractory hyperkalemia, fluid overload that is refractory to diuretic therapy, which is usually more common in chronic kidney disease rather than in AKI, and complications of uremia, where a markedly elevated urea level can lead to things like uremic pericarditis, uremic encephalopathy, and severe nausea and vomiting. In the setting of a severe AKI, dialysis may be the only way to resolve these severe manifestations. Patients can have these manifestations and hence an indication for dialysis at a wide range of serum creatinine levels, ranging from around a few hundred up to over a thousand micromoles per liter. And hence it is the presence of these manifestations rather than the absolute level of the serum creatinine or even urea alone that guides the decision to start dialysis. So now that we've talked about the AKI definitions, we can go on to discuss the underlying etiologies and management. 